Hi everyone and welcome to another video. I'm Nora Macar and today I'm going to talk about the books that I read in the first half of Nova October? October, yes we're in October. I had a big bug there. Uh, as it turns out I am back into the reading side of things and it makes me happy. I was not reading that much for the past couple of months and I can even say I think I was in a reading slump um, and I am now once again devouring books at I don't know, there, I have my hunger for books is back and I'm really happy about it. And it means that in the first half of October I already read five books, which means that a video might be a good idea. One of the books, the one that I will talk about last, um, is A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth. I'm gonna talk about it last because I'm gonna do a slightly longer review for it, so you're gonna have to... I'll try to put a timestamp if I can um, below if you just want to skip to that part, uh, but otherwise I'm going to start with the four other books first. So the first book that I finished was uh, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane by Lisa C. Uh, it's a historical fiction set mostly in China, that I liked a lot. Lisa C also wrote uh, The Island of Sea Women, which is sent in an island in Korea that I read and really liked last year. And this one also focuses on a group that lives a kind of different life. So she talks about, the book is mainly about a Chinese minority. Apparently there are many Chinese minorities, uh, eth ethnical minorities, but at one point um, they had been counted and they were 52 and all of the ethnic minorities that had been found afterwards were just kind of pushed into that group of 52. Like, no, we had decided that there were 52, there can't be more. So um, this ethnic minority are called the Appa, I believe. Now I'm hesitating. Um, and we follow a young woman that is part of that group. Uh, when she is young, we see how her family lives this very secluded life in um, Chinese tea mountains. They sell tea to a corporation and they live a very poor life. And she is the only girl in the village that gets a little bit more of an education because she is... Uh, very intelligent and at one point there is a man that comes to the village who has decided that he wants to build up he knows that there is this very very good tea and he's trying to look for it uh, a tea that has a special fermentation um, this book talks a lot about tea and it was very interesting to learn about that and she is the only person that talks Han Chinese so she is the one that uh, communicates with this man and she is the reason we could say that her village starts to become more and more wealthy because they get to sell the tea that is special, especially from their mountains. Um, so because she's educated and because a little bit more money comes in, she also uh, leaves the village at one point and having lived this very secluded life um, in a very poor village that has these uh, very that has all of these traditions moving out of the villages is a great shock to her. Um, so we learn about that as well. It was, um, I really like the way Lisa C writes her novels because all the interesting tidbits about tea, about the Appa culture, um, were intermingled with a story that I still found interesting. She, this young girl, uh, we see her grow at the beginning of the book. She's still a child and then uh, she's a 16, 17, 80 year old that wants to get married uh, with her boyfriend. Obviously her family does not want that. Uh, we see her getting married, we see her moving through, leaving her village and her life afterwards. Um, her relationship with her mother is very interesting. Her mother is the village um, midwife, so we see a little bit about the cultural things surrounding that. For example, the, at the beginning of the book, a twin is born, and we see what the beliefs were about twins. Um, we see the value of tea. I loved seeing the value of tea. I, I drank a lot of tea while listening to this because of, I don't know, I realized how much tea is more than what it is to me, how much more fragrance there can be, uh, all of the, the, 
I don't know, the cultural that, that is surrounding that. Um, another aspect of the book as well is adoption. Um, I don't really know whether this is a spoiler alert or not, so if you plan on reading this and you don't want to know uh, that you might want to skip this little part. Um, but our main character at one point has a child and that child gets adopted in America. We see a little bit also about that, so if you don't want to know about it, I don't know. Also, it's also a topic in the book, it's not very big. Um, the only negative about this book, I would say, would be the ending. I thought the ending was a little bit too easy, a little bit, you know, all of the puzzle pieces just fall into place. And one of the things that I did appreciate uh, in the, the main storyline was that everything was not necessarily easy. Of course, she is the girl that is educated, etc., etc., but somehow that didn't mean that everything went easy for her. And at the end, it was a little bit... A little bit too picture perfect, but yeah, I would definitely recommend it if you like historical fiction and you want to learn about, you know, it's not, it's it's really this ethnic minority within China and, I don't know, fascinating, would recommend it. Then, I actually found myself reading another book that is mostly set in China, however this one is very different, um, it's a short story collection called The Land of Big Numbers by... Hey Ping Chen, yes I just had to check that. I did not know this was a short story collection. Uh, I thought somehow because of the cover that you can see here and the num the name that it was going to be a non-fiction, it was a short story collection. There were, I listened to this on audio so I don't really know, but between six and ten short stories about different people, um, not necessarily always living in China but at least with a Chinese background, a couple, I think maybe two, lived somewhere else, and also not necessarily in the US. Um, but they all live non-standard lives. They kind of, all of them had something a bit different to them. Some of them were, I mean, a lot of them were a kind of weird, like stalkery, or trying to misuse the system and be fraudulent. Some were kind of lying to their spouse about their background. There was always something, they were always trying to hide something somehow. Not, I don't know, there was, because they all, it felt like they were all under this kind of pressure and that made them do things that, in a kind of negative atmosphere. It's always difficult to talk about short story collections because you know you can't really pick one or two out. I like the last one most, I think that is the one that is called The Land of Big Numbers? No, the last one had a kind of sci-fi atmosphere to it. Um, but yeah, it was a fine short story collection. I, I, I actually read another short story collection uh, at the beginning of the month that was written by different authors. Um, that one is um, The Granta Book of the African Short Story and that was edited by Helen Habila. And this one was by different authors. And I have to say that reading a short story collection that is by one author worked better for me because you don't have to always switch to a new style. Uh, so this one was completely different on the one hand because there were all of these different styles and all of these different authors. Gosh, how many how many people wrote stories for this one? Let me count them more quickly. Yeah, there are 29 stories, so 29 different contributors in this one. Uh, so it's a very different collection and uh, all of the short stories are also very different, they have very different themes, you can have everything in there, I mean it's all, it's, all of them are literary, contemporary liter uh, fiction. Um, there are some well-known voices in this, uh, let me take out a few, Chimana Ngozi Adichie is one, uh, Laila Lalami also I believe is well known, uh, okay I thought uh, Maza Mengista is also, has also written one of these novels. Um, I liked most of the voices in here. Somehow, because you have all of these different stories, it's easy to compare them to one another, so it becomes very quickly that when one is not interesting, I feel like not reading it. Not sure if I appreciate that. My favorite was one that was set in Kenya, 
where people that are not Maasai were then put on a kind of Maasai tourist reservations. So white people that are going on a safari would go to this reservation to live the Maasai life for one day. And then you would have these people that are, that are basically singing gibberish songs and they're just to have sex with all the rich white ladies and stuff like that. And the commentary on the way, uh, in this case, the Kenyans were viewed was so spot on somehow. I love that story. Uh, of the other ones, there are there are so many that I, that even now looking at the titles, I have no idea what it's about. But it's a good way to get to know some new authors. Um, there are a few that I at least marked kind of in my head and that I have to see if they have other books out. So that is the Granta book of short stories. Now the last book that I want to talk about before switching to um, The Suitable Boy is uh, the book that I read for my book club. We haven't had the book club discussion about it yet, but that is The Deep by River Solomons. It's a short book and it's a powerful one. The premise is super interesting. So uh, the premise is that this is about an undersea people. They are descendants from um, enslaved people that have, well, enslaved women that have been thrown off of ships on their way away from Africa, mostly. Um, and their unborn babies, while they, when they had been um, shoved off the ship, um, their unborn babies, when they are born, were then picked up by whales and manatees and other other uh, sea creatures and they kind of transformed and now they are these sea creatures, mare people kind of beings and um, they have a very interesting, and that is what the story is about, peculiarity to them. Well, there are multiple peculiarities, let me tell you. But one of them is that most of them don't have, well, none of them have memories. They have chosen that one of all of them is called the historian and that that person carries all of the memories of all of the generations so that the rest doesn't have to carry this burden of knowing for example where they came from uh, how how I mean the the trauma that is linked with that uh, they can't remember some kind of war that they had with the surface dwellers which are the humans they don't even remember, per se, interactions that they've had the other with other people, uh, people, uh, other mere people. I kind of forgot what the name of the this underwater, these underwater creatures is called. Um, but they will, they will kind of know that they've had a fight about something, but then not know what the fight is about. And this book is uh, written from the point of view of the historian. Uh, and she is struggling a lot with all of these memories and at one point decides because once a year um, the mayor people do all get the memories so that they get tethered a little bit more that they remember who they are otherwise they kind of start becoming a little crazy and uh, she decides while well, she's given them all of the memories that she if she doesn't leave at that moment if she gets the memories back then she will not survive so she kind of abandons them uh, to try to, like I said, survive. I love the way that it was written. It's very atmospheric. There isn't a lot happening, but there's a lot of feeling and a lot of emotion and a lot of... It's a very powerful book. The themes in it about the importance of where you come from, the importance of memory, of, you know, is the past important? Is the present important? How do you know what your future is going to be? Um, the value family also is in there. Uh, I really like this and I'm really looking forward to discussing it with my book club. I think it's a good book for that. Uh, I don't know if it's for everyone because it does feel rather intense. It's a short book. I think it was only a four-hour listen, but uh, yeah, very intense. Now lastly, A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth. If you've been here a little bit longer, you know that I have been struggling. Well, struggling. No, not struggling. I've been reading this book for, I think, the past three, three and a half months. I think I started somewhere in July. Um, this is a chunker. It's an Indian classic. Maybe not yet a classic. It's been written rather recently. I think it came out in 92, maybe 93. 
um, but it's a 1500 page monster um, and it is really really good uh, it was masterfully done because at no point did I feel like I was struggling through the book yes of course around the end I was looking forward to being done with it but there's so much happening and it's still happening in a clear way that it did still work for those 1500 also written in tiny font with little margins pages. What is the book about? So this book is set in India in, 19, in the 1960s, shortly after the independence and at the tail end of the partition, maybe still a little bit, there is still a lot of tension between um, Muslims and Hindus in this book, but it's not the main focus at all. We follow uh, four rather wealthy families and the things that they deal with. There are two main storylines. One uh, pertains mostly to the title um, and that is the storyline of Lata. Lata's mother has decided that she must get wedded that year basically. The book starts off with the wedding of Lata's sister and at one point her mother kind of turns around towards her and says you're next. Uh, and so the book talks about this arranged marriage, her mother trying to find someone, a suitable boy for her. There are a couple of people that are interested, a couple of boys that are interested in her and how she deals with that, how her family deals with that. Some of the boys, one of the boys she very, is very much in love with but is found unsuitable by her family, so we have all that. We also have a little bit, um, you know, the early month of her sister's wedding. Um, her, the, so her sister's husband, um, has a brother and um, he is what the second bigger storyline is about so he's called Man and he falls in love with a high-level prostitute called Saida Bai and his family does not like that at all in that sense he is not a suitable boy he is actually at that point also he's promised to someone but uh, he's also he's a little bit of a player Anyway, his father is the Minister of Economics and he sends him off to the countryside to forget about this woman. Those are the two main storylines, but through these two main characters we see a whole bunch of people. At the beginning of the book there are four family trees, so there are four families that we follow more or less uh, closely, so the two that I just talked about. And then there's also the family of the, the friends of Man, they are... Muslim, so through them you also see some of the tension between the Hindus and the Muslim at that point. And there's also a fourth family that was very entertaining called the Shatterjees. They are very well off, none of the children work. Um, they are from Bengal, so you see a little bit, very, I mean, it could have had done more with more Bengali culture. Um, but they have very loose tongues and are very critical and very egocentric and they were, I love the Shatterjees. This book gives a very good idea of the wealth of Indian society at that time. Through all of these characters, you see a lot of different things happening. One of the other storylines is uh, political and that is surrounding the Zamindari Act. And the Zamindari Act is to ensure that the people, that all of the big landowners don't own all the land, but that if a person has been working the land for more than five years then the land becomes them and kind of how that is seen by the different political parties how that is seen by the very wealthy landowners like this this Muslim family that is one of the four families that we talk about but also some less well-off landowners in the countryside where Man goes there. There are so many parts to this book one of the things that I liked was how everything was woven in very subtly and sometimes it does mean that there will be a topic that you found interesting for example I really like the topic surrounding um, the women that were living a very very secluded life because of religion so they weren't allowed to uh, see men that were not in their family and there is a character called Zainab that at one point that talks about loving being in that enclosed um, side of the house with only the women and how the women talk and I would have loved to learn more about that uh, but it's one of those many little topics that you kind of get a spark from and then it kind of disappears back there are a few things like that that, that kind of in the end we'll talk about the ending 
felt like they weren't finished off very well, that I would have wanted to see them even more interwoven. I mean, they're interwoven into the book, but not time-wise. They didn't really come back often. It was just one thing, and then another thing here, and another thing here. There's, for example, there is talk from socialist movements, from students, there is, there is so much, uh, which is what makes the book good. The ending, however, is such a disappointment. I think the last 200 pages felt like Vikram Seth had all of these wonderful storylines, all of these characters were going somewhere, and then he realized, wait, I need to finish the book, and then just batched it all up, and that was it. There are things that happen in the ending that I thought were and me and the people that I was reading this with, because I didn't say, but I was reading this with Paula from Draw Your Books, Jotna from Jotna Books Capades, and Ash from Pages uh, to Hearts, the Instagram page, all of them linked down below. And the ending felt like the choices that were being made there were very uncharacteristic. No, not character driven. No, that's not the word. Not really based on what we thought we knew from the characters, like they made very sharp decisions that we missed the build-up that you also have through the rest of the book. So even though the book is big, I would have preferred it to be a couple of hundred pages longer just so the ending... I'm fine with the decisions being made, but I would have loved a slower build-up to them, or not a, such a drastic thing. There are, by the way, a uh, couple of you know, this book kind of just floats around and you're entertained and there are a couple of moments where these very, very drastic things happen and that they just kind of make you sharp again. Uh, that I love those parts. Well, I loved the very dreadful things happen, but uh, I really appreciated that they were included in the book. I would definitely recommend this. Yes, it's a chunker and I wouldn't necessarily do it the way we did that it was we read it throughout nearly four months, um, I, but it is so easy to read. It helps that the book is split up into 19 parts and that each part is roughly 100 pages and you, you see a lot of characters, but at no point did I not know what someone's storyline was. So that is, again, very impressive. So I would highly, re highly, highly recommend this book, even if you're afraid of big ones. Those were the five books that I wanted to talk about. Um, if you've read any of these, let me know. What have you been reading? Uh, I know there were more people that were kind of in a reading slump, so I hope you are doing well. I hope the weather is nice. I hope you're happy. Um, and I'll see you in another video. Ba -dum, ba -dum, dum.